Now we move on to our next presentation, which is by Professor Walter Broberg. Thanks, Tom. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, let me thank uh, Dean Mangle for the introduction and for your leadership and building bridges among all babies. I want to thank Admiral Harley for his extraordinary leadership here at the New York College. Um, for having the courage to, to think big and to think different, and uh, even in the face of strong headwinds, and empowering us all to do the same. I want to thank my co-lead Admiral Sonis for his friendship and for advancing the ideas of sea power over a 38-year career in the Royal Indonesian Navy. So it's only fitting that you continue serving here at this institution, whose motto is victory by sea power. Finally, let me thank the amazing faculty and staff here at the college who had a hand in bringing this landmark initiative together and this opening seminar of life. Truly a team effort. So it's a great privilege to address the many distinguished sailors, scholars, and guests who have gathered here for this important occasion. Since the U.S. Navy's infancy during the American Revolutionary War, it's had a presence right here on the Arrogance Bay. You know, and it's remarkable to think that 135 years ago, at the height of the Gilded Age, this nation's naval leadership created this institution to study and report on any question related to war, the statesmanship of war, and prevention of war. Admiral Luce envisioned a college that could help the Navy achieve a wide range of national goals beyond just warfare. And this same foresight led Admiral Burke to create the international programs here at the college 62 years ago, with the idea that the survival of the free world depends upon the combined ideas of free men and free women. You know, from the writings of Mahan and Vago, to the lectures of Theodore Roosevelt, and the countless war games that gave rise to the legendary rainbow plants here at the college, and as the birthplace of the International Sea Power Symposium, Newport is the site of imagination, inclusiveness, and progress. And it all started with a simple idea to better educate the fleet. Ideas are what power our nations and our navies. Our imagination sets us apart, but today it brings us all together. Participation in this initiative stands as a testament to your continued commitment and curiosity, not only to the fields of sea power and security, but to this great adventure we call the Arctic. And today the world stands on the verge of a blue arc. It's a time of hope, a time of opportunity, and a time of challenges. The time for exchanging ideas and for thinking about the role sea power can play in shaping this new ocean. It's also a time to deepen our knowledge about the shared responsibilities that a warmer and wetter Arctic brings to our navies. But it is our shared values, our enduring commitment to free and open markets, societies, and seas that continue to bring us all together as people and as nations. It is with these ideas in mind that brought our, brought our nations together 20 years ago in Ottawa to create the Arctic Council, affirming our collective commitment to cooperation and security in the Arctic. The Sea Arctic Coast Guard Forum and the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable, giving us stronger cooperation efforts in search and rescue and human and environmental safety issues. Admiral Sahn has helped spearhead both and making his leadership instrumental and shaping the region's first multinational collaborative research effort on security and defense. This initiative isn't, is not meant to align with or replace these forums, but perhaps inform them. And our effort is particularly timely in the run-up to ISS 23 in September here in Newport. And as many of you know, our work this week will continue virtually in the months ahead. We'll meet again later this fall and again next spring. But the fruits of our labor will be briefed out and published to Arctic Heads of Navy. So there's a thawing mystery waiting to be unlocked. And this important Arctic initiative will change that by giving sailors and scholars the platform and tools to get a more complete and accurate picture of what's changing on, below, and above this new ocean, and a better understanding of how we apply and integrate sea power in it. And this knowledge could be, or will be, transformative. As humans, we can develop life-saving vaccines and identify galaxies light years away. We can study the theory of evolution, but we still haven't unlocked the mystery of this falling ocean that sits to our north. 
Today's sailors and scholars almost possess the capability to study how the geography of our oceans have shaped the destiny of nations and how sea power has made the world we live in today. But no one person, no one navy, and no one nation has all the knowledge and all the capability to fully anticipate and adapt to an opening Arctic. So as a result, we're still unable to guarantee the free flow of goods and services by way of our northern seas, or fully prevent regional hegemony. And the most powerful navy in the world isn't nearly as effective as the united navies of like-minded nations. I believe the decades ahead can be a golden age of sea power, a maritime age where our northern seas will be more important than ever. It is here in the Arctic Ocean region where we find our rapidly melting polar ice cap, the shortest maritime trade route linking Asia, Europe, and North America, one third of the world's untapped hydro departments, an increased abundance and distribution of fish and minerals, the historically intense relationship between NATO and Russia, and the rise of China's third ocean strategy. This, coupled with surging populations and energy demands, greater dependence on the seas, and aggressive naval modernization and expansion amplifies rather than diminishes tensions and competition in the Arctic. Today, Arctic and non-Arctic states alike are actively and strategically position, positioning their policies, and in some cases, their navies, to influence commercial conditions and protect national sovereignty and interests in the region. An opening Arctic provides a unique opportunity to chart a new course of relations among Arctic nations and natives, one based on mutual interest, mutual respect, on the simple truth that we're all neighbors and do not need to live in fear or in fierce competition, one based on a collective commitment to uphold principles that benefit all nations, like rule of law, individual rights, and freedom of navigation and overflight, including an open Arctic shipping lanes. Yet I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that True and everlasting peace and progress cannot be achieved without Russia's cooperation, including in their participation in this initiative. I'm hopeful that they will come. In large part, this is because our military cooperation with them is, is currently in a, in a deep freeze. A stark reminder that our actions on the world stage do not happen in a vacuum, and that our actions in one region can have unanticipated consequences, even in our north. As the Arctic Ocean becomes more complicated and more interconnected, the more potential for even more serious unintended consequences grows. For, from increasing northern fleet patrols and bomber flights to the string of new bases, ports, and airfields, Russia's military buildup in the Arctic has not gone unnoticed by the world, leading some to believe that conflict between Russia and the West is, is inevitable. Not in my view. In my opinion, the most this calculation and accident or mistake is the most likely catalyst to confrontation in the Arctic. The likelihood of a mistake or miscalculation is not limited to just national leaders, but the thousands of forces that occupy or transit the Arctic now and in the future. And as a hedge against, un uh, against uncertainties, we want to lock in as fast as we can further confidence building measures to prevent conflicts and accidents and miscalculations. And this Newport Arctic Initiative is a, a good first step in that direction. And only together can we increase stability in times of calm and crisis. So I believe at this critical moment, we all face a choice as people and as nations. We can choose to navigate these uncharted waters <coughs> to a better model of cooperation and integration, united in purpose and strength. Or we can retreat into these emerging maritime crossroads, sharply divided, ultimately in conflict. So as threats to our northern shores evolve, so must to our economic, our security, and defense relationships. There must be a persistent effort between our citizens and our navies to listen and learn from each other. If, if our relationships are solely defined by our differences, we only embolden those who seek total war rather than genuine peace. I believe we have a solemn obligation to break this vicious cycle. Now I recognize this won't happen overnight and it won't come easy. Just as it it will take decades before we see a completely ice-free Arctic. I think it will, take, it will take nearly that long to completely thaw and realign our relationship as one Arctic region. I believe free, preserving freedom of the seas consistent with international law is essential to us all. 
Every nation enjoys the rights and freedoms to operate ships and aircraft in the maritime market. And I believe the, that free and open markets is the greatest force for creating and distributing wealth. Like the world sees, however, when they run aground, through excessive risk-taking, or lack of oversight or care, then all are at great risk. But if we live in Reykjavik or Murmansk or right here in Narganza Bay, the opening market makes our northern flank vulnerable to foreign penetration and control. And with this in mind, I believe the long-term challenge to a free and open Arctic is the authoritative and aggressive rise of China to Russia's south, to Europe's east, and now to our collective north. Make no mistake, China benefits from a divided Arctic. Through all instruments of national power, seeks to gain influence in, access in, and influence over Arctic neighbors. As part of their third ocean strategy to control the Eurasian continent and achieve global dominance. And China's ambition to build a polar silk road is already underway. Projects of mining and energy to infrastructure and financial products, China's already investment towards that of any other nation and is in keeping with that of a great polar power and a great global power. In the last few years, we've seen China become an observer state in the Arctic Council, take ownership of rare earth mineral deposits, unsuccessful attempts at funding and building deep water ports, mine an old naval base. We've seen China build its first domestic icebreaker and polar expedition cruise ship and increasingly fish in what would be U.S. waters. Just this month alone, China discovered the largest recorded energy, su energy supply in Russia's Arctic and released its first official Arctic policy, declaring itself more than just a near Arctic state. A red China is the core challenge in the blue Arctic. History reminds us that exploration is too often followed by conflict. This is truly a once in a lifetime chance to change course and and shape a new international order bound by cooperative sea power and collaborative research. Because it's people, not platforms, that decide whether the Arctic will remain an ocean of peace or a new theater of war. And we would make a major error if we underestimated the challenge the Arctic or Arctic Ocean region poses, or overestimated the stability of the current cooperative system of international states that the Arctic challenges. We're being asked to do more with less to invest and test the new capabilities, prepare for uncertainties and contingencies that we cannot begin to predict. And most of us are asked to do all this under tightening budgets. These are the same kinds of challenges that drove the Ameri American Sea Services to reduce cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power in 2007, rooted in the simple idea that preventing wars is just as important as winning them. Now, we don't know what the Arctic will look like 20 years from now, or 50 years from now, or even 100 years from now. We know that if we keep investing and testing our ideas, the better off we'll be able to identify these problems before they occur. And the smarter and more collected our response will be. And as this new motion grows in size and importance, it is clear that education and research is the most powerful investment we can make. For a free and open Arctic, depends upon a knowledgeable, skilled, and educated Navy and nation. Because when our leaders are educated and informed, our needs buy better and they perform better. But we are at our best when we perform together. When we're at our best, I believe we can achieve, achieve anything. So let us, let us think, let us discuss, and challenge ourselves and each other's ideas. Really, this is what this initiative is all about. I understand this is an ambitious task, and, but it's achievable because the challenges we face require us to be ambitious, to think differently, and to step up now as individual nations, but also as one Arctic. The decisions we make and the thoughts and actions we take will shape the future of this region for generations to come. That's who we are as free people and as free nations. That's why this Newport Arctic Initiative is so important. So we have to be ambitious, and we have to embrace our responsibilities as natives and make sure that the opportunities we explore and identify actually have an impact and can help leaders solve their world problems. If we keep taking bold steps like the one we're taking this week, I'm confident that the Arctic will continue to lead the world in the next frontier of human understanding. And all of you, collectively, are going to help us get there. So as we set sail for this new ocean, know that your greatest 
ally and friend of the United States, stand with you, mind to mind, bow to bow, today and tomorrow. Because a united Arctic, or the dream of a few, remains a necessity for us all. So I'm very excited about this initiative, and I'm really looking forward to working with each of you. Thank you very much.